Hello everyone and welcome to the Talking Football podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to say we're joined on the line this week by Adrian Goldberg. He's just recently released uh, a fantastic uh, film, the, the Celtic Boys Club Scandal on YouTube. Uh, Adrian, it's great to have you along. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Hi Derek, yeah, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, when we talk about the film you, you've released, Adrian, before that, though, maybe anyone that's maybe unfamiliar with, with your work, um, can you give us a wee background to what you do and, and, and what, what made you um, make this film? Yeah, well, the potted history of my, uh, I suppose, journalistic career is that in the mid-80s, when football fans were getting all kinds of flack and were being routinely bullied in the national media and all written off as hooligans. I started what I think was Britain's first national football fanzine, a magazine called Off The Ball. I was just an ordinary fan. At that stage, I just started my working career, really was hankering for a career in journalism. And I started a, a fanzine and very shortly afterwards, when Saturday come, came along as well, there was The Absolute Game, which was a fantastic magazine in Scotland as well, and loads of different club-based fanzines. But I was very much for advocating for supporters' rights and getting a voice for fans. And sadly, it took the tragedy of Hillsborough before people, before supporters were really listened to. But that set me off on a career of journalism. I suppose the... Uh, the mountains, if you like, of that career have been four years as a reporter on Watchdog, working alongside Anne Robinson. And then uh, for a decade from 2010, I presented a weekly show on Radio 5 Live called 5 Live Investigates. Uh, since then, I've been really plotting my own course as an independent broadcaster and freelancer. I run a podcast called The Byline Times, and I also run various other podcasts. And while I was just looking around social media for a potential interviewee, I stumbled across a few tweets by a woman called Michelle Gray, who lives in Glasgow, talking about her brother Andrew. It turns out that Andrew had been abused while he was a, a young player at Celtic Boys Club. And although his abuser had been brought to justice, Jim Torbett, who was convicted of abusing Andrew and other young people, Michelle was asking who at Celtic knew about Torbett's behaviour over the years, why had nobody done anything about it, and why even now were Celtic still insisting that there was no connection between themselves and Celtic Boys Club, which was obviously a feeder club for Celtic. So that piqued my interest. I made a podcast. It went absolutely ballistic. And from there, really grew the idea of, well, is there a real deep story here? Could we get crowdfunding to make a film for it? Which we did. And so uh, along with a colleague, a, a guy I've known for years called Lawrence Leonard, who was the director on the film, we thought, yeah, let's, let's see if we can tell this story. Because bits of it, many bits of it had been told here, there and everywhere. Nobody had really brought the whole story together and told it from on a consistent timeline from then to then to then to now, and that's what we tried to do with the film. Yeah, but it's such a, a grave topic. I mean, it's, it, it has been brought to the fore now. But back when you were growing up, Adrian, in England, was, was it something you were aware of or was it just something you stumbled upon, like, like you say? I think probably like most kids who grew up in the 70s and 80s, you know, there were individuals, some of them around football, some of them not, some teachers who people were suspicious about in terms of their relationships with with children. Uh, and, you know, I think there was perhaps a, an attitude that, you know, people had to be kept an eye on, but perhaps I don't think the authorities and maybe even parents were as vigilant as they ought to have been in, in the past. But, you know, these were always understood to be grave and, and serious offences. You know, they were, they were always on the, on the statute books. Um, so, I mean, obviously I wasn't aware of what had happened at, at Celtic, although my best mate who has sadly passed away now and lived in Birmingham, who was a, a Celtic season ticket holder for many years, once on a journey to go and see a Celtic game with him, he did tell me that there were suspicions, whispers, rumours, allegations surrounding individuals either connected to Celtic Boys Club or Celtic FC. So I already had a little bit of an inkling, but I didn't really know much about it. And it took Michelle's 
interview for me to really understand some of what had been going on. Yeah, I mean, the film itself, Adrian, how long did it uh, take you from start to finish? I imagine it would take quite, 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 quite a farewell to, to gather all the, the information that you require to get it out, out in film. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's been an eight-month labour of love, really. <laughs> uh, we started crowdfunding in July 2020. The pandemic hasn't helped, of course, yeah. because it's been difficult to go and interview people and do all the filming that we wanted. So as you can imagine, there were people who we really would have liked to have interviewed, who declined to be interviewed. Mm-hmm. Lou Macari had written about an awareness of abuse at, at Celtic and Celtic Boys Club in his autobiography, which was published quite a few years ago now. So I went to see Lou Macari at a homeless shelter that he runs in Stoke-on-Trent. He was very polite, very courteous, but he, for example, declined to be interviewed Obviously, there are various legal hurdles that we have to be aware of as well and make sure that people who are named in the film, who we suggest ought to have had a greater knowledge of the rumours, at least, of what was going on, people like Jack McGinn and Kevin Kelly, we had to give them a right of reply and and see if they were going to come to the wicket for us. So it, it has been a long journey and... You know, all I can say is that <laughs> there have been times when it's been really tough, but from our point of view, it's it's been worth it. We want all we wanted to do was do justice to the victims, to survivors, their families, to highlight the fact that we believe that there has been a cover up at the highest level of Celtic Football Club over many years, and that really at a corporate level, Celtic FC have never accounted for what was done in their name. Uh, and it, and, it, and it, the, the film then leads to a, a call really for mandatory reporting of abuse so that if anybody has a suspicion that they have a duty in law to report it because numerous people were aware of suspicious activities, either at Celtic Boys Club or at Celtic FC, who for one reason or another did not bring it to the attention of the authorities. I think a change in the law would, nothing's ever going to stop child abusers attempting to abuse children but this might make it much easier for people who have suspicions to blow the whistle much sooner yeah. uh, you mentioned the, the the gray family of course uh, we see you interviewing them in, in the in the video how, how harrowing harrowing was that adrian to, to speak to them obviously that their son andrew uh, was abused he would later take his own life it's just a tragic story isn't it yeah i should just clarify andrew tried to take his life three times in the end he died in a tragic accident, actually, in a, in a swimming pool in, in Australia. But clearly, disclosing the abuse that, that he had gone through, having kept it quiet for 30 years, was pretty traumatic for him. And I'd spoken, as I mentioned, in, the, in, in an original podcast interview with Michelle, but that was done from my laptop here in Birmingham, where I'm yeah. speaking to you from. And at that point, Michelle was in Glasgow at home. So there were whatever... 300 miles between us, maybe more. So going to the family home, meeting Andrew's mum, Helen, for the first time, just sitting there as you do and getting out the old family photos and the old family albums, it gave me a real sense of who Andrew was and what a bright young lad he had been, not just on the football field, but just as a a kid. And then seeing that promise that he had kind of, dulled and tarnished by the abuse that he suffered about which the family were unaware but but they knew something was up and they talked about Andrew flying into rages having to be restrained by his dad punching holes in doors and so on I think when you're in a in the situation in the place where these things happened it can't help but bring it bring it home to you really and it's a you know it's a really really sad story what I've done over my journalistic career, though, is I meet people who are engaged on campaigns like Michelle Gray and like Helen Gray. I'm just amazed at the courage they have. So although there's, you know, the sadness, sorrow, what's gone on, the feeling I come away with is, is you know, the, the indomitability of the human spirit. Michelle and Helen are real fighters and they're not going to stop until they see justice done for Andrew. Yeah. You spoke to Gordon Woods as well. I found it harrowing when he said he tried to vomit during one instance and being abused. He says way back in the sixties and what have you. I mean, like, he's another one where 
I mean, it's hard to believe, isn't it? These kids um, were targeted in this way. I think what's really telling about Gordon's testimony, and I mean, it is very powerful testimony from Gordon, and like many victims of abuse, it's taken him years to come forward. But what Gordon says is that had he and had others spoken up earlier, then young Andrew Gray would not have been abused. And I think Gordon still finds it really difficult to come to terms with that himself. Obviously, we know that that's how abusers work. You know, they make their victims feel shame. They make them feel as though it's their fault. And that clearly was the case uh, with Gordon. So, you know, you can't blame people. That That's that's part of the manipulation of, of the process of abuse. But I think, you know, Gordon, as he says, he found it very difficult to, to acknowledge that had he somehow found the courage to speak up earlier or one of the many other victims of Torbett's abuse, then it's possible that Andrew might have survived, might have escaped the abuse that he went through. And, you know, that's that's just a hard and horrible fact of the situation. But of course, in, in that scenario, the real people who should have spoken up were not people like Gordon. They were victims. He is a survivor. The people who should have spoken up were people around Celtic Football Club and Celtic Boys Club who were aware of suspicions of abuse kicked Torby out of the, the Celtic Boys Club. But then when Jock Steen had left, uh, and Steen was, from all we can tell, was aware of the allegations of abuse, once Steen had kicked him out, then and, and Steen himself then had left Celtic Park, then Torbit was allowed back, both to Celtic Boys Club and to a position at Celtic Football Club. Uh, that's just mind-boggling. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I mean, that's uh, the Jock Steen situation. I mean, you hear rival fans taunt um, Celtic supporters because of it. And, and it's, it's an issue that's a sensitive issue because he's so highly regarded, isn't he? Celtic, he's, he's a god there. But it's these figures that um, we're asking questions about. I mean, he doesn't have the right to reply as well, which, which is unfortunate. But it's, it's these sort of figures that, that would clearly have known about what was going on. I mean, the, you know, the the opinion is divided on how much Jock Steen knew, and in the film we reflect testimony given by Hugh Burt, who was, I think, president of Celtic Boys Club, who gave testimony on oath in court that Jock Steen was aware of the rumours of abuse around Jim Torbett. We speak to Ian Ferguson, who was the Daily Record journalist who broke the story. He says that anybody around football in Glasgow at that time would have been aware of the rumours as well. Now, in court, when Jockstein made those comments, there was there were two Celtic directors who contradicted Hugh Burt's testimony. One was Kevin Kelly. Now, Kevin Kelly had a very close business relationship with Jim Torbett, so how credible is his defence? And there was another Celtic director, a Mr Farrell, who also said, that, that Jock Steen didn't know. So we try and give weight to both of those sides of the argument. But if you've got a president of Celtic Boys Club in Hugh Burt, whose own personal position was at risk if he blew the whistle on the situation at Celtic, and he stands up in court on oath and says that he believes that Jock Steen knew and he gives his personal testimony, then it for me, it's very hard, very hard to argue against that. In Jock Steen's defence, I mean, the evidence is that he did kick Jim Torby out of the football club, out of Celtic Boys Club, with which clearly Celtic FC had a very close relationship. So it, it wasn't as though Jock Steen didn't care and took no action. But the question is, was the action that he took and many, many other people associated with Celtic Boys Club and Celtic Football Club, was the action sufficient and was it appropriate? History su suggests not. Yeah, you mentioned Jack McGinn, of course, in the film, we, we go and see you try and uh, speak to him. He had a pretty angry response when you went to ask him, ask him questions. It's disappointing not to get a response and, and let these guys maybe, uh, is it a bit quite telling that they, they don't give their side of the story? Well, I'd love to have spoken to 
Jack McKinnon on the record. I mean, every effort was made. And after we, we did that interview, I, I sent a, a, a letter to Jack McGinn's house. I sent a letter to his legal representatives. Jack McGinn had every opportunity to respond to the allegations that we were putting in the film because we wanted to hear his point of view. In every story, there are two sides, at least two sides. But he, he chose not to not to take advantage of that. It would have been great to hear both from him and from Kevin Kelly, who we made strenuous efforts to contact as well. I think in the past, what's happened is that they have been approached by journalists. And certainly with regard to the BBC, who's Mark Daly had done some fantastic work in tracking Jim Torbett down to the United States, for example, in 2017. What generally happens is that if you send a letter uh, outlining some form of response, certainly the BBC's attitude, and I know this from my many years working for the BBC, is that you can't justify what they call a doorstep, which is where you turn up with a camera and interview people. I think that's a cop out. I, I think that allows people about whom there are serious questions to get a, a lawyer on board, to write a response, say, yeah, I didn't know this or I did know this. And, and from that point on, you can't do a doorstep. Well, I, I think people want to see the people who have been asked tough questions of, and they want to see those tough questions being asked of them at the door. So that was part of the freedom for me of not being part of the BBC, is that I could do this film the, the way I thought it should be made. And, and I, even now, if Jack McGinn wanted to speak to me and sit down, if Kevin Kelly wanted to sit down and speak to me and put their side of the story, I'd be delighted to hear it and I would broadcast it. What did you make of um, Celtic's uh, separate entity uh, response? I know a, a recent SFA report sort of poured cold water somewhat on, on that, but in terms of that response, uh, sort of divided opinion to say the least. What, what, what do you make of that, Adrian? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why families feel that even though in some cases like Jim Torbett there have been convictions this is why some people feel that justice hasn't really been done because Celtic Football Club is talking about this a, a legal situation in which Celtic Boys Club was in their words a separate entity now in fact since making the film I've come across more evidence somebody challenged me and said Sorry, I've come across more evidence that, that the two organisations were linked. So in the film, we say there is it was reported that there was a financial relationship between Celtic Boys Club and Celtic FC. Since making the film, somebody's actually sent me copies or, or reports from old Celtic views, which talk about the financial support given to Celtic Boys Club by Celtic FC. But there were all these other signs as well. There were there were matches played, and there's a little bit of footage in the film. There were matches played by Celtic Boys Club at Celtic Park. Youngsters at Celtic Boys Club were allowed to train at Barrafield, Celtic's training ground. And there were very close links as well in personnel between individuals at Celtic Boys Club and Celtic FC, who often had roles both at the Boys Club and at the football club. So to me, it just does not wash for Celtic to say that they were a separate entity from Celtic Boys Club. As allegations of abuse started to emerge, perhaps Celtic sought to distance itself more from the Boys Club. But I'd say for 60s, 70s, 80s onwards, that there was that there were they were practically indistinguishable. I've spoken to one former Celtic boys club player who went on to become a top professional footballer in England who didn't want to be in the film and he said when he was growing up and playing through Celtic boys club he understand understood that they were separate entities as I say you know later on maybe there was a an, an attempt to distance the two organizations but certainly many of the people I've spoken to 60s 70s 80s when which was I suppose the peak of this abuse that Really, you you couldn't put a, a Rizzler between them. Yeah, and I mean the film touches on the, the, the amount of uh, victims that, that suffered the abuse have taken the, their own lives. It's 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 that it's the sort of tragedy, isn't it, Adrian? That there was a, a paedophile ring taking place, and so many victims that that that, that weren't um, given the justice that they deserved. 
That's right. And I think that, you know, that's where I think Celtic FC need to step up and offer support. You know, it's all very well offering sympathy and regret and sorrow. But in practice, they are still maintaining that they have no responsibility for the youngsters who were abused at Celtic Boys Club. Now, those victims of abuse, those survivors of abuse, they need help even now, you know, even if they're if they're men now in their 50s, 60s and 70s, they need help. They need emotional support. They might need other forms of help as well. And I, I think for Celtic not to be trying to take that on their shoulders or at least engage with those victims or survivors' families, I, I, I just don't get it. You know, there's a level of... Celtic have always been very... In my time of, of knowing about Celtic, they've always been very proud of their charitable origins. They've always been... Their support base has prided itself on being supportive of social justice. Well, if you want to be true to that tradition, if you're Celtic, then you should be looking out for these victims of abuse now. Yeah, but you tried to get a response as well from the, the Scottish Justice Minister, uh, Humza Yousaf. It wasn't very forthcoming either, was he? Which is, which is again, a bit disappointing. It's strange, isn't it? I mean, the, I, I still struggle to understand why... The, his, when the Scottish Parliament set up a, an inquiry into historic child abuse, it chose to section off football. Why? Why would you do that? It, it also sectioned off other parts of Scottish society as well, I think, including the church. Why? You know, the, the, the way in which abuse works, the way in which it's protected by powerful institutions doesn't matter whether it's football, doesn't matter whether it's the church, doesn't matter whether it's a school, the, the way in which abusers work follows a pattern, certainly according to the experts that I've spoken to in the field. So why would you kind of palm off football to the Scottish Football Association? Obviously, they commissioned a, an, an independent report, but many of the survivors or families of, of victims were, just weren't convinced that it was truly independent I, you know I don't, I don't know about that I'm not casting any aspersions on the people who carried out the independent report but what I think really doesn't matter it's it's got to be credible in the eyes of victims and in the eyes of survivors as far as the Scottish justice minister is concerned I, I know for you know clearly Michelle Gray and her mum would love to meet him and feel that when they are given the opportunity to meet say the children's minister, that's a bit of a cop out that really this is justice and it goes to the heart of the justice system from our point of view as filmmakers as well i would say that we were not trying to embarrass the justice minister we were not trying to in any way make him look foolish this is right on his turf the call that we hear in the film for the introduction of mandatory reporting of child abuse is clearly 100 percent a question for the justice minister yeah. so why is he shirking what's he what's he why is he hiding what's he why is he running away from us come and talk to us i mean we're open to reshooting this film and and making a, a further episode you know if you're listening to us Humza yusuf please come and talk to us we'd love we'd love to have you on board and have you on film on on camera yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you talk about mandatory uh, reporting, uh, Adrian. Yeah. You spoke to, of course, Tom Perry. Um, what was what, your feelings uh, around about that? Oh, I don't think there's in my in my mind there's there's no question that mandatory reporting would help to identify offenders and reduce the risk to young people. I, I can't see any sensible argument against it. It's very interesting to me that both the Scottish Parliament, the Holyrood government and the Westminster government have backed off from it. And I really don't know why. I haven't got a sensible answer as to why not. The uh, independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in England is also going to look at this. So when the English FA did their report into historic child abuse and the question of mandatory reporting was raised, they only raised it to say, but we'll leave that to somebody else. We'll leave it to ICSA. I just don't understand whether politicians think that if we had mandatory reporting, the system maybe would be overwhelmed by reports of child abuse. But remember, mandatory reporting is only about if you have reasonable suspicion. I mean, clearly in the case of Jim Torbett and others 
associated with Celtic Boys Club. There was loads of grounds for, for reasonable suspicion. But if you either have to say, well, look, if people have got reasonable suspicion of child abuse and we're worried that we might be overwhelmed, then you have to ask yourself, well, don't we need to fund the justice system properly? Don't we need to ensure that these victims are assisted? We can't just say it's going to be too big of a problem. So let's not go there because yeah. the people at the heart of it are young people who are being hurt and who and, and for whom the hurt will last for decades. The SFA, we touched on, released a report recently. It took them several years to, to um, publish this. Have you had a look at that, Adrian? What's your sort of key findings from that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a pretty exhaustive document and, and they've spoken to uh, clearly many uh, victims and survivors. I know that in particular, Michelle Gray, who we interviewed in the film, was very angry because she feels that testimony that was given to the report was misrepresented yeah. and that uh, it, it suggested, for example, that Andrew Gray's father was aware of the abuse, but chose to downplay it for fear of jeopardizing his son's football career. Michelle says that is absolutely not true. The testimony was not checked with the family before it was published. So in that case, the family are very angry at the Scottish Football Association. Beyond that, I mean, clearly there's been an, an intelligent attempt to grapple with you know, what is a very big and difficult subject. But the again, I come back to the fact that the absence of any recommendation around mandatory reporting, I think there were I think 95 or 97 <laughs> recommendations in that report. That feels like a cop out to me. Like why, why would you not say that it should be a legal responsibility to report genuine suspicions, reasonable suspicions of child abuse. Because, and we hear this in the film from Dr. John Marshall, the way in which abusers work is very often to have this protective cloak around them because they could be quite powerful in an institution. So if you're the person who speaks out against that powerful person in an institution, if you're the whistleblower, you risk being sanctioned, you risk being punished. So the balance of power at the moment is in favour of the abuser. Whereas if it's mandatory reporting is law, then the organisation can't take any sanction against you because you're only doing what the law demands of you. Yeah. Uh, I was reading as well that you, you, you've got plans to write a, a book about the, the issue. You've set up a, a fundraising campaign. Is that right? Well, we hope to raise it. <laughs> there was a target of £30,000 to write a book. And I think the, the crowdfunding campaign topped up at £17,000. So wow. I, I don't have the time or the money, if I'm honest, to write a book. I'm not sure as well whether, although I, I would still like to like to write one, I'm not sure that that's the best way to serve this story because there are elements of it which are still ongoing that we, we can't really talk about, but I, I, I am committed to running a, a podcast. So once we've kind of sorted out all the, the finances and paid the insurers, paid the lawyers, I mean, it's, it's a pretty expensive yeah. business making a film, pay for all the archive footage, you know, which is, which is hugely footage, uh, which is hugely expensive. What, once we've done all that, there'll be a little bit left in the pot. And I, I do intend to, to continue making a podcast about it. There's a couple of episodes of the podcast there already, the Celtic Boys Club Scandal podcast. And I will continue to make that podcast. I, I want to stay in touch with the people that I've interviewed for the film and, and speak to more people because this story has not yet been told in its full entirety. We've tried our best, yeah. but there is more to come. And both in film and on podcast, we will be trying to... We will be trying to follow the story and and continue to do justice to the survivors. Yeah, and in general, what's the sort of response been like, Adrian? I know, and it's certainly in, in Scottish football, <laughs> Planet Glasgow, they call it a lot of whataboutery and what have you. But um, what's what, what? How have you felt that the response has been? We've been accused of weaponising sectarian bigotry. <laughs> <laughs> so that phrase, that whataboutery that you refer to, has cropped up a lot. And yeah. I should stress, by the way, that. Uh, a, a lot of Celtic fans have come to us not always wanting to be identified publicly and said that they support what, what we're doing. I don't want this to be about Rangers versus Celtic. It really isn't. As I've mentioned before, my best mate 
was a Celtic fan, a se- Celtic season ticket holder who travelled regularly from Birmingham to see the team. And, and I've, I've had happy days at Celtic Park. But there are some stories where you can't say, oh, well, you know, if, if Celtic did this, what about what Rangers did? Clearly, there have been failures. A, a number of clubs in Scottish football and English football over the years, clearly they have. What struck us about the Celtic story was the scale of abuse, the number of years over which it had happened and the failure at the top of the club over many years to grapple with it. So that's why we chose Celtic. So there have been some unkind words said towards us. I I would really strongly resist those. That said, uh, and of course, you know, maybe it's human nature to focus on the negative the response that we've had overall has been incredibly positive. I know that Michelle Gray and Helen Gray and Gordon Woods are, are proud of the work that we have done. The other people who've appeared in the film are happy with how we have represented them. And we've tried to do nothing more than, an, than a good, honest job. And I think if, if Celtic fans looked into their hearts and, and, and tried to get past the fact that this is about their football club and just see it as a film about a major, powerful and much loved institution which hasn't done all that it could to protect victims of child abuse. I think they'd like it as well. Absolutely. I'd totally recommend it at the Celtic Boys Club uh, scandal on, on YouTube. Go and check it out, folks. Adrian Goldberg, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on. Thank you very much for, for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. Thank you.